Our first acquisition was to buy a firm that was making a loss, so we brought it for a pound. Within 21 days, it was profitable. If someone brand new went into the accounting industry and brought that business for a pound, they, they might not have been able to do that quick enough. So, uh, Johan, you are the managing director of On Point Accounting, and your colleague Martin is on my current mastermind program. And I think you've met a few of of, of my other clients along the way as well. How have you been helping those clients? And you know, t- tell us a little bit about what you do at your accounting firm. Well, yeah, so I've met quite a few of your clients over the last two years. Many of them are just initial phone calls. We help them just sense check the business that they're looking at acquiring. You know, they come to us saying, these are the accounts, look, it's nice and profitable. And then we go and look at, we go into the balance sheet and say, mm, it might be profitable, but profit is a figure that can be moved on paper. What's more important is how's the cash flow? Now you've got a load of yeah. loans in there, credit cards in there, for example, high purchases. How does that all impact on the cash flow? And if the cash flow is not right, the deal just can't go ahead. Because if it if it's not going to support the day-to-day running now, how's it going to support the deferred income? So yeah, so we spend quite a lot of time just getting people to think more around cash flow. Cash flow is the blood of business over a profit figure and you know, profit and loss and balance sheets. Clever accountants out there will do clever things. Absolutely. So, you know, what's actually in the bank account, they can't really do much about that. That's that's what you need to run the business. It's what you're going to potentially use as initial consideration. It's what's going to keep the business running as you grow and invest in that business. So we get them thinking more about the cash flow and how they're going to run the business on a day-to-day basis mm-hmm. rather than it's got a profit. This is the multiplier. I'm going to make this offer. Sure. And, and 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 the profit, as you say, is, is it's just something that's written down. It doesn't necessarily translate into cash, and you and you need cash to pay the bills and yourself and exactly. the vendor. Yeah. So so if we were to 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 say, what are the top three things that you look at the very first time someone presents you with a set of accounts? What would those top three things be? We always check the bank account first. Is there cash in there to do a, to help them? structure a deal is there cash in there that's going to help them give them some due uh, initial consideration to the to the old owners then we look at how much debt is there how much work in progress is there how much stock is there can that help negotiate down the initial consideration does it is it actually detrimental to the business you know we got one client that we were looking at and the debt was so so high and that was on a 12 month old set of accounts and when, by the time we got even more up to date data the business just wasn't feasible mm-hmm. and we just said look the easiest way to do this is actually go get them to go to the administrators and prepackage it for you because exactly. it's the only only way you could have financed that so we look at the bank balance then we look at our all the debts etc and the creditors and then after that we will have a look at the profit and loss and we'll see kind of where we're we spending this money that's going up in and out on a daily basis is there potentially some reorganizations that can happen within the business whether that's employees supplier contracts credit terms refinancing of the debts because a lot of people what a lot of people don't realize about accountants is especially general accounting firms We deal with a lot of people, with a lot of clients in a lot of different industries. And in my opinion, we're at the heart of this network of businesses where we can take all the best learnings and help share that best case scenario and that best learning across the rest of our clients. So we've got one client that's done a fantastic job at saving money on her electric bills recently. So we're just saying, look, we've got one client, she's got a smart meter, all of a sudden she's got all this trans- visibility of her usage. She now turns off her coffee machine at night and that's saving her four quid a day. But it's taking loads of money. And when you do a hundred things like that, it, start, it starts to add up and it can move a business from, from, from doing okay to doing quite well. Exactly. So that when someone comes to me and, and looking to buy a business and hospitality and they've got this set of accounts, I don't just have to sit there and go, well, you're going to have to replace that that owner. As a, you're going to have to bring in a manager and stuff. But I can go, well, that utility consumption seems quite high. Mm-hmm. We could probably mm-hmm. see that drop by this. So we can give them a, real, a much more realistic overview of what could happen in the next year to two years for them if they follow that advice. And I, and I think you're, you're, what you've just said is, is so practical because that cash flow is way more critical than, than profit because you, know, you can be making a profit, but your cash flow can be shot to pieces because clients pay late or that, you know, there's no payment schedule, they're out of terms, they, they pay in arrears rather than in advance. And all of those, all of those different things can take a, 
perfectly sound, profitable business on paper, but it can run out of cash, especially if, you're, if your sales drop through some sort of seasonal fluctuation, for example. Exactly. You know, yes, this business is profitable, but is it only actually really profitable two months of the year and mm. really struggles for 10 months? Is that the yeah. case? So yeah, yeah. the new owner needs to be aware of that. And that's why we always look at a cash flow rather than a, and we like the breakdown of the ma- monthly management reports over just a set of annual accounts. If you're looking to sell your business, you want to have instant accessible financial data and you want it to be live so you can get the best value for your business because the accounts that are two or three months old or up to 12 months old may not be the true reflection of where your business is now. And actually, if you had true accurate figures available up till yesterday, then actually that information may put your business as a vendor in a more valuable position because it's done better in the last since the last set of accounts yeah and you're not showing that so i think there is a joint responsibility between the accountants and business owners to make to have modern accounting systems and processes yes and that is one of the things we always encourage any of our clients that come through due diligence with us if they are taking over a business that have got desktop based softwares we're always encouraging them the first thing you do is you rip out that system and you put in cloud based because you've got real live time mm-hmm. information that, that everyone can share that's completely shareable so example of due diligence in between two companies one's got quickbooks for argument's sake one's got sage on the on the desktop for me to do due diligence on the one with sage i need to contact the accountant ask him for a load of reports i go through those reports i then have to ask him a series of questions i need to have drill down sent over to me it takes weeks give me a company that's using quickbooks or zero I can ask the accountant to give me a read-only login. I can have due diligence done in two or three days because I'm not having to go backwards and forwards. So if you're if you're a vendor and you're trying to sell your business, you need to start planning ahead. So if you know in the next year you want to sell your business, talk to your accountant about getting cloud systems. If they're dead set against it, then is it worth moving accountants when you're wanting to sell within a year? Probably not. But talk about to if they're dead set against cloud, then talk to them about how you can make sure you've got accurate management reports up to the end of every month, and how that what's that process involved? What do they do you need to give to your accountant, and what turnaround times can you expect from them? Because then you can go into any acquisition deal talks with relevant information and say, look, it's the fifteenth of August. The, this is my management accounts up to the thirty first of July. This is current. This is right. Let's talk about this rather than looking at my accounts that were eight months ago. Yeah. The other thing that often happens is that the whole diligence process takes so long. By the time it looks like you're getting near to the end, another quarter has passed. So they, so, so the, the buyer or the seller wants a, uh, needs to provide another quarter of management accounts. So if you're working massively in arrears, it really, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, it's a, you're, you're constantly chasing your tail. Where if you're doing it the way that you describe, where everything's in real time and it's up to date and those accounts, you know, the, 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 the bank is being reconciled every week or even every day, then you actually get to a point where you can work in real time. Exactly. And as you said, like, so we now find the thing that slows the due diligence process down is lawyers normally they move at their own pace there is no egging them on to go faster they are just lawyer paced and then the second bit that slows things down is the vendor or the acquirer they're not quite got the pain point to the point that you need them to have you know so the two deals i've done i've done within 10 working days of heads of terms to completion and handover of so these are these are acquisitions that you've done yeah okay yeah so i've done two acquisitions myself and you know so literally one we've spoke about it for the first time around the 14th of July and we completed and took over on the 1st of August Mm. because cloud accounting software, we kept it simple so the the client didn't want a solicitor and we had our terms and conditions already. So it can be really quick, but if you've got a slow solicitor and you've got a slow vendor or a slow acquirer, then don't start the financial due diligence until you are comfortable that you are within a month of the close of the business of the deal because if you get me to come in and do your due diligence today but you don't actually do the deal until the first of january i'm gonna to have to do it again because yes. so much has changed in that time they could have borrowed money they could have emptied the bank accounts there could be all sorts going on if you want to find out how to buy a business successfully get your free business buying toolkit the link is in the video description below i, I tell you a process that i i've used well i used just recently this year in fact was engaging 
one of the the large accountancy firms, Grant Thornton in this case, to do vendor due diligence. So so they provided us with a with a pack that allowed us to approach. Well, you could use it to to raise money as well as to to sell a business, and that would that that gives the the potential lender or the potential acquirer a, a sense of comfort around the figures at at a at a level of of detail that internally we we would not have been able to provide. Yeah. yeah so all, all, the, all, all the forecasting in there, everything that someone would would look for. Now, to be fair, it cost an arm and a leg, but but it but it did its job. Yeah. And I mean, the other thing we found is that's made our due diligence processes a lot quicker. If you're planning on raising finance on this company that you're going to buy so you can finance the deal, then get the get the lenders to do most of your financial due diligence. They're going to make sure what's affordable and not. They're going to exactly. do all the credit checks and stuff. So actually, if they've already signed it off and given you an offer, that gives me a load of confidence that actually these books are pretty bulletproof um, and it makes our job a lot easier. And it can speed up the process a lot faster. Yeah, it's interesting because sometimes people say to me, "Look, if I if I use asset finance to buy the business or, or some sort of uh, debt against the the debtor book, if I raise money against the debtor book, how do how do I know that the business can afford it?" And I say, "Well, they wouldn't lend it to you unless the business could afford it. Exactly. That's their job to figure out that that it that it is affordable to the business." Yeah, exactly. They're going to do a lot of the work for you. Now, commercial finance, it's nowhere near as cheap and friendly as the personal finance world is. Yeah, they're going to do. Some of them will charge you commercial consulting fees some of them are then going to charge you a percentage of the money you've borrowed then they're going to get a kickback from the bank as well for putting them the business their way it's a good good industry to be in if you can be but if, they, if you're going to pay them that kind of money then why do I think twice let them do that financial due diligence make sure it's affordable as a business model and then we can come in and type the loose ends for you yeah ab- ab- absolutely and how do you deal from an accountant's perspective with a the owner of a business who says that they have assets fixed assets of a certain value they've got stock of a certain value and they want 100% of that value right here right now otherwise they're not doing the deal I mean, it's. I tend to leave it in the acquirer's hands to decide whether that's what they're going to do or not. If they can afford it, that's their choice. But I would always say, look, you're going to go in there, you're going to find a dent on that car, which means it's not going to actually be as valuable as possible as it should be on the books. And ultimately, the way we value things in the accounting world, it's a very old fashioned, centuries old process with assets and depreciation. You know, it used to be I would buy a PC and that would go on you know, that go on my, as one of my assets and sit on my balance sheet and depreciate over five years. If you go out as a graphic designer and buy a PC today, you and I know you're probably going to sell that PC within a year or scrap it because it's not powerful enough anymore to do what you need to do. So is that an asset to your business or is it just an expense? Same with photographers and their SLR cameras, etc. Assets and depreciation have become a real gray space. So I don't normally count cameras and computers and laptops as assets because they normally don't last more than a year and if you try to sell them after that year they're probably pretty worthless Um, whereas there'll be a huge balance on the asset sheet if you look at the value through depreciation method so i would always recommend that the owner the acquirer goes in and views that stock is it in date is it in good condition is it what they say that say it is and does it have the value they say it actually has? And the same mm-hmm. with the assets. And again, if you're getting asset finance, they are really good at checking the value of any assets that you're going to try and finance. Absolutely. So it's a really good are. due yeah. diligence stage yes. for you to do. You know, if you're going to go into a company that's got a fleet of vehicles, then get your finance people to go and have a look at it and see what they come back with as an offer because mm-hmm. they're going to validate the value of those assets beyond your balance sheet that you're looking at from the Bender. Yeah, because they understand the resale value, which of course is their security should should the loan default. So exactly. So so, so uh, an, another thing that accountants do is that they they put as much as they can into into the asset register in order to increase the profit. Yep. So they 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 capitalize it rather than expense it. So you've got this this growing asset list and a growing profit alongside it, and I think that can that can sometimes make a business look better than it truly is because if as you just said if you expense those items it would reduce the profit anyway exactly you know i've i've looked at companies that have got usb sticks worth 20 quid sat as an asset on their balance sheet (laughs) and that brings me back to that first point of accountants can do all sorts of weird and wonderful things that are completely legal and above board to enhance your profit if you're trying to sell 
And it's very obvious to other accountants when we look at those accounts that this has been fattened up for selling, whereas normally you probably wouldn't have declared that tax, Mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. profit to the HMRC and you wouldn't have been prepared to pay that amount of tax if you weren't looking to sell. So that's why we always go back to that cash flow. Like, yes, great, you've got assets. Yes, they need to be double checked for value and stuff. But ultimately, the true asset is the money in the bank. That can't that can't be moved around. And yeah, that's why we always favour the cash flow situation over the profit number on a set of accounts. So one question I get asked a lot in our in our link, we've got a private LinkedIn group for for people on the mastermind. Is they they've found a business and maybe there's an agreement to to buy that business at a at a price that's equal to three, three point five, four times pre-tax profits, so effectively earnings, and then and then the seller drops the bombshell that they want an additional half a million pounds for the assets. Now the argument is typically, well, if you took those assets away, and so actually we don't really want those, we just want everything apart from the assets. Is there actually a business there uh, because? The assets allow the business to operate and produce the profit, and you can't have one without the other. Now, that's my very sort of non-technical, non-accountant way of describing it. So, how how would you describe that better for so everyone understands it clearer? I, I think you're completely right the way you have explained it. I mean, I always try and put everything into plain English for anyone, just because I'm not. I don't think accountancy is a black magic. I don't think we need to talk in jargon and try and spellbound our clients into thinking we are the only people that can understand this. Ultimately, it's their business. They need to understand their finances. But it's as you said. That's all well and good. They want half a million for their assets, and the assets represent that on the balance sheet. That's fine. As the acquirer, you need to decide: Have I already got some of those assets? in my other businesses. So do I actually need their assets? Do I value their assets greater than the balance sheet says? So maybe they've got an all singing, dancing printing machine that you've not got and you're, that actually adds a huge amount of value to your other businesses. In which case, then you need to come up with the value in your mind of what you're prepared to pay for. And if you've not got any assets, and or it's a whole new business and to you, industry to you, and you've never brought any of those assets before, do you need those assets, as you said, to run the business? Because if you do, you need to find a happy point for you and the vendor to buy those assets from them. Then are the assets really tired? Actually, would you be better off in the long run saying, you know what, keep your assets. I'm going to buy new because it's going to be, they're going to last longer. The maintenance cost is going to be cheap. The running costs are cheaper in the utilities because they're more environmentally sound these days than they used to be. There's lots of varying factors you just need to take into account. And that's why it's really important to have some have an accountant that understands the concept of business. So we we dealt with quite a few people that have come from bigger firms where the due diligence case has gone to their team. And it's a team of people that have come from school, college, university into employment. And that's great. Their qualifications are fantastic. They've studied hard to get that. They know all the technical stuff. They know the jargon. They know the numbers and they can see the patterns, but they've not got any business experience. And that will always put them at a loss, really, because they can't emphasize with the business owner. Like the first thing I do when I look at it is I go, would I buy this business myself? Uh, is it too risky for me? And if it is, I'll tell them. I said, look, just so you're aware, as a business owner, this is above my risk level. But I'm happy. If you're happy with the risk, I'm happy to help you. And you can't get that from every accountant you work with. So finding accountants that understand and can emphasize with being a business owner is really important. Yeah, interesting, interesting. It depends also where your risk profile sits, doesn't it? Mm. You you have some people who who are, are willing to take a punt on something, and they're willing to lose the money and you should never invest money that you're not prepared to lose because you never know what's around the corner and and are willing to take more of a chance. I mean, the, the guidance that I always give people is that your first business should be solid and profitable, which probably means it's quite a boring business. Yeah, it's, it's not a, a sort of a, it's not an app, for example, which, yeah. May may be a multi million pound success story, or it may be a complete disaster. It's it's something like commercial cleaning, or or a dental practice, or or something that has a reliable history that isn't likely to change with a new owner. What what are yeah. your thoughts on that? Completely agree. You want something with reoccurring income. Yes. And- Anything with a subscription model. Yeah, I, I love the subscription model. I think any business in theory can offer a subscription. I've got a client who made chocolate brownies and Christmas cakes. She did all right. December was her best time. But her brownie orders throughout the year were a bit hit and miss. We encouraged her to do a, 
subscription model where the subscribers get a box of brownies in the post every month. She's three, four times increased her business in the space mm-hmm. of a year because of it. Mm-hmm. So anything with good, reliable, reoccurring income is fantastic because you can plan your cash flow. And when you can plan cash flow, you can plan your investment, you can plan your growth. It's all brilliant stuff to do. Buying a business is a roller coaster, which is why you need a lawyer who knows what he is doing. So why not use mine? His name is John Andrews, and you can find his contact details below this video. If you're going to go into stuff where there's maybe not reoccurring business, then you want to go in and find, make sure you've got the contacts in the industry. So for example, if you're going to go into haulage, who are the current contracts with? Now, is that contract with that company because they're their mates and they've been there for 20 years and actually will they will that contract move or is that contract there because you do a really good job with asda for example and asda is not going to move that contract just because there's a new owner they're going to move it based on service and price you know if you're look if you're going into the big into a world like energy for example then you want to make sure your suppliers are blue chip companies because that's where you can get your invoice financing they're also really reliable payers so yeah it's it's making sure you, as you say the risk is to your own appetite but i would always encourage your first business to be a steady consistent mm, performer absolutely yeah. absolutely too too many people i think look at distressed businesses as the first acquisition because it looks inexpensive but you always pay somewhere you you pay with your time yep. you pay with your energy and it might be a business that at some point needs money to go into it so you weren't putting in at the start but you're putting it in three months later so that the reliable profitable business is better in so many ways exactly yes you're going to pay a bit more to get it but it gives you that really strong foundation i mean so all go into a business that you understand and know and you've got proven history so yes our first acquisition was to buy a firm that was making a loss it was losing money hand over fist so we brought it for a pound within 21 days it was profitable because it was in the accounting sector. I could easily get rid of a load of the f- costs because we've already got them covered in our, in, the, mm-hmm. in our other firm. And I had the expertise to go in and do it and turn it around. If someone brand new went into the accounting industry and brought that business for a pound, they, they might not have been able to do that quick enough. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A, a principle that I've been uh, teaching people in Mastermind recently is to, if that first business is that profitable, solid reliable business is to, once you bought it, to raise money against it as quickly as possible. Exactly. So either with an overdraft, sometimes you can just get the overdraft online. You don't have to even speak to anyone these days to, to get an overdraft. Some sort of business loan in there. And, you know, I, w- I was with a lender just a couple of days ago and they, they were they were very comfortable giving cash flow l- loans of two and a half times EBITDA. But as soon as you've got that, that, that lending in there, you can use that money for the second acquisition. And then you can do the same with the second acquisition to fund the third. And this sort of momentum that you that you build up means that you can you can build your group without any finance coming from you as an individual, but it's actually coming from the businesses that you're buying. Yeah, completely. And we we do the same kind of thing. We we look to leverage finance against our current businesses to buy the next one if we need to. People listening to this podcast, thinking about buying a business. They're watching the video. They're thinking, "Is is I, I'm I'm interested enough to watch the video and listen to the podcast?" But I haven't actually done anything yet. I haven't I haven't made that first step. And usually, it's that it, it's fear of the unknown, isn't it? It's it's fear of making a making a mistake. So, what sort of advice would you would you give those people? My advice is take that first step. Get on with it. You've got nothing to lose, everything to gain. If that first step is sending out some letters, it's going to cost you however much it costs you in stampage, paper, printing. But if you don't send out those letters, you'll never know. There's people that were in social network groups that I'm in that were looking at starting their accounting firm five years ago when I started mine. They're still looking. They're still finding every excuse in the world to not be ready to do it. I need to write my risk assessment policy. I need to do this. I need to decide on what software I'm going to do for this. I need to build my website. Well, five years down the line, I run a group of six different accounting brands and they're still sat there saying they're going to need to do something. If you don't take that first step, you're not going to get anywhere. Yeah, no, that's uh, that, that's great advice and a theme, I think, across so much of the content that I that I put out about getting over the procrastination, taking the first step, 
if you do it the right way with the knowledge and the education, then your 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 risk is so minimal. We can eliminate it altogether, and and the upside is absolutely huge. It can be a, a life changing upside, can't it? 